Hey, welcome along. There was a delightful moment of television entertainment the other day at the White House press conference uh, when Jim Acosta of CNN and Stephen Miller went at it over the administration's new immigration proposals. And I talked about it uh, that night with Tucker Carlson on Fox News and also wrote about it the following day. But I want to say a little bit more about it because it's a fascinating example uh, of the sentimentalization of public policy, which afflicts all free societies throughout the Western world these days, uh, and nowhere more so than in the area of immigration. And I think actually, even in terms of immigration in Europe, Canada, Australia, wherever, uh, it affects sentimentalization, affects clear-headed thinking, uh, even more so in the United States. Uh, let's just see. Let's just see that little bit uh, uh, on Fox uh, on, at the White House press conference. What happened is the, the the government has got these proposals. Two senators are proposing a bill. It's uh, because it's a bill uh, that means they want to pass it into law, and because it's a law, it means it's full of uh, a lot of clauses and laws and public policy. Uh, and in this case, it proposes certain changes to immigration policy, for example, an end to chain migration uh, by which somebody gets a green card and then they bring in their little wizened aged aunt and the aunt brings in a, a wizened cousin. And uh, pretty soon you've got one worker and 27 relatives all along the chain living on welfare. That's a particular problem with countries where they don't have reliable uh, public records such as Somalia, for example, you basically taking someone's word for it that they're your aunt or cousin or whatever. So there was going to be an end to that. These are specific policy proposals. Uh, yet when presented with them, CNN's Jim Acosta decided it was a poetry reading. The Statue of Liberty says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, your ain't to breathe free. That, uh, that poem he's quoting is, of course, the New Colossus, uh, it's not a well-known title, but most of us know the bit about your poor, tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be breathe free, the uh, whatever it is, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore, the teeming refuse of your wretched shore. It's one of those kind of poems. It's a sonnet. A lot of people don't know the title, The New Colossus, but they know it as the Statue of Liberty poem. And in a sense, as you can see from Jim Acosta, this poem... Uh, has uh, become the Statue of Liberty. Uh, as insane as Jim Acosta's behavior was at that White House press conference, uh, the ensuing reaction was even nuttier. Uh, for example, U.S. News reported that uh, Miller's remark, the White House advisor appeared to distance himself from the 1883 Huddled Masses poem inscribed at the base of the landmark, chiding reporter Jim Acosta. Miller's remarks shocked many, even as supporters argue the symbolic poem technically isn't U.S. law. Uh, that's the report from U.S. News. They're breaking the news to shocked Americans that a poem isn't the same as a law. You've got poetry over here. You've got laws over here. Uh, you've got all kinds of stuff by Longfellow and Lord Tennyson and Keats and Shelley over here. That's poetry. And then you've got laws over here. And when Shelley said that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, uh, as he did in 1821, uh, he didn't mean for us to take it literally, as we do with this Statue of Liberty poem. I don't know whether uh, reporters take any other poems literally. I don't know whether uh, there wasn't a young man from Nantucket, whether that is also uh, regarded as law. But Michael Beschloss, the presidential historian, doubled down. Stephen Miller pointed out that this poem was stapled to the Statue of Liberty 20 years after it had been put up. And uh, Professor Michael Beschloss, the presidential historian, objected to this on MSNBC. Uh, Mr. Miller saying that the poem doesn't count because it was put on later. You know, it's sort of like the Bill of Rights was ratified four years after the Constitution. So the Bill of Rights isn't very important either. Uh, it's not actually like that, Professor Beschloss, because the Constitution 
uh, is law and the Bill of Rights is law, but the poem isn't law. Nevertheless, it has uh, entirely afflicted our ability to comprehend the immigration issue. Uh, and as I said in my column, bad poems make verse law. Uh, just to reprise what happened here, because everything has seemed to uh, been uh, perverted, as it were, by this poem's uh, stapling to the base of the statue. Uh, the French gave the Americans a marvelous statue of liberty. Liberty. It's of the Roman goddess Libertas. Libertas? If you don't speak Latin, take a wild shot at what Libertas means, the Roman goddess Libertas. Uh, and uh, it was called by, uh, the, it was designed by Frédéric Bartholdi and it was built by the Eiffel Tower guy. And uh, it was called La Liberté et Clarons le Monde. Liberty enlightening the world. That's a big concept. They're putting up a statue. The French give the Americans a statue to put up in the harbor with a torch, a torch to enlighten the world with liberty. And uh, around about the time they're doing this, that's the statue. Around about the time they're doing this, uh, people in New York think, well, if you've got a statue, you've got to put it on something. You've got to put it on a plinth. You've got to put it on a pedestal. So they decide to have a whip round and start fundraising for the pedestal. And a lady called Emma Lazarus writes a poem to help raise money for the pedestal. And 20 years after the Stade of Liberty is dedicated, they decide, actually 17 years, because I don't want to, I, I might as well be pedantic in case Professor Beschloss is uh, upset about all this. Uh, they start actually, uh, 17 years later, they, they put, uh, they, they put her, they make a bronze plaque with her poem on it and they give it to the Statue of Liberty people who put it on the pedestal. And it's not even on the pedestal now, it's actually somewhere inside that thing. But what has happened is that the pedestal has swallowed the statue. And actually this is an incredible feat, it's never happened before. It's never happened before. Most people, I mean, you've got Lord Nelson on his column in Trafalgar Square, but people, uh, the column hasn't swallowed the statue. It's, it's great because there's Nelson at the top. If you uh, uh, go to uh, Hillsborough in, in Northern Ireland, there's a spectacular, there's just like a subdivision of houses and then there's like a bit of cow pasture and in the middle of the cow pasture, there's a, a, a huge great column with the Marquis of Down, I think it's the third Marquis of Down, so it's one of them, up there on the column looking out over the Ulster farmland. Again, it's a spectacular column, but it's the Marquis who's up there who counts. Uh, this is, this is, what has gone on here is unprecedented. The French built the Americans a magnificent statue and psychologically, in the psyche of America, the statue has been completely obliterated by this doggerel on the plinth, on the pedestal. And so a, a great statue of liberty has become a statue of immigration. And as that exchange with uh, Jim Acosta demonstrated, uh, it's basically uh, so central to American sense of themselves that uh, that it's almost impossible to get beyond it. Even when you make specific immigration proposals, uh, reporters object, presidential historians object. No, no, no! You can't get beyond this poem. This poem is the beginning and end of our view of immigration. And it's funny to me, just, just to take the argument that the reporters advanced, you know the usual thing, nation of immigrants, uh, Great uh, great grandparents coming here from Eastern Europe, uh, just uh, no money, uh, la landing at Ellis Island, all, all the myths. 19th century immigration myths. And that's, that in itself is fascinating. The progressive left isn't interested in, say, 19th century ideas on marriage, you know, it's between a man and a woman. Uh, they're not interested in uh, 19th century ideas on homosexuality. They're not interested in 19th century ideas on anything except the immigration myth, the immigration myth. 
And what's interesting to me is that it precisely inverts the meaning of the stanza. Emma Lazarus's poem uh, precisely in, inverts the meaning uh, of the statue. Um, and I said a few years ago that the, the statue is actually an inspirational idea. It's a spectacularly big idea. It's like, it's like saying, here I stand and I hold my torch of liberty. And if you on that far distant shore can see the big idea I'm holding up, liberty enlightening the world. Uh, it's, it's not someone who's like some uh, village babushka waiting there on the shore for all the teeming uh, refuse to wash up and cluster around her skirts. Um, it's not, the Statue of Liberty is not about importing people. It's about exporting ideas. It's exporting, about exporting the central idea of liberty. And just to, just to bring that back, uh, just to remind us of that, uh, Monsieur Bartholdi uh, helpfully has uh, Libertas, Lady Liberty, holding uh, a tablet inscribed with the date July 4th, 1776. July 4th, 1776. Was there any immigration going on that day? No. There was a group of British subjects who decided they had had enough of His Majesty the King and no longer wished to be his subjects. No, it was not an immigration issue. They, they were uh, Englishmen, Irishmen, Scotsmen, uh, uh, who, whose uh, uh, forebears had come to the American colonies and decided they didn't need the big guy in London telling them what to do anymore. July 4th, 1776. Uh, he spells it out on the tablet. At the foot of uh, the figure is a chain the chain that was broken on July 4th, 1776. Again, nothing to do with immigration. And uh, it pains me to have to say this, uh, but one of the problems, uh, because I speak as uh, an Ontario United Empire loyalist, so I was on the other side of that squabble in 1776, uh, but that in the inversion of the statue's meaning, you have actually inverted the idea of the revolution and the revolutionary war. After all, what are we saying? If, if the Statue of Liberty means that you losers out in your dump dysfunctional states on the other side of the planet all just need to climb into the boat and come to Ellis Island, that's actually the precise opposite of what happened on July the 4th, 1776. Uh, these guys didn't say, we're sick of King George III, so we're all going to get into a boat and uh, ask Haiti if we can be taken in as refugees. They said, no, this is our land and we are going to fight for liberty in our home. That's the meaning of the statue. That's the meaning of the date. And that's the lesson for everyone around the planet. You don't make Yemen better by taking in half the population of Yemen. You don't make Somalia better by taking in two thirds of the population of Somalia. You don't make Libya better by taking in three quarters of the population of Libya. You say, no, look, you, you, you teach by example. You say certain states uh, have developed systems of government that work uh, and other states have not. And obviously, in the course of that, the people in the failed states will want to move to the non-failed states. But we cannot, uh, we cannot preserve our liberty uh, if we do that. And if we allow that to happen on the scale that, for example, is happening in Angela Merkel's Germany uh, or in Sweden right now. I took part in the monk debate in Toronto uh, last year, and we talked about uh, uh, the refugee situation in uh, Europe. The more failed states that stay failed, the more failed states there will be. So ultimately, ultimately, it is better for Syrians to be able to live in Syria, for Afghans to be able to live in Afghanistan, for Iraqis to be able to live in Iraq. It is better for there to be more beacons of liberty around the world. I confess, 
I've never liked the Emma Lazarus poem that is stapled to the bottom of the Statue of Liberty. Uh, the, French, the French gave the Americans a fabulous Statue of Liberty, and the Americans nailed a third-rate poem to it and turned it into a celebration of mass migration. Liberty and mass migration have nothing to do with each other. And I was up against uh, Louise Arbour. Uh, who was uh, the UN uh, High Commissioner for, uh, for Human Rights. And she began, uh, Megan, who's a Canadian member of the Mark Stein Club, writes to remind me of the way she began. She goes, I saw your posting today of your closing at the Monk debate. And since I now, never tire of watching it, I had to watch the entire debate again tonight. A wonderful debate, but I quite enjoyed the irony of hearing Louise Arbour's opening joke about impending illegal immigrants about to rush across the US-Canada border due to Donald Trump's presidency. And it's true. Madame Arbour made a joke. Uh, this was uh, last year, so it was a couple of months before the US election in Toronto. And she said Canada had been blessed not to have a refugee crisis on its borders with people just pouring across the borders trying to get into the country. Although, she said rather drolly, depending on how the US election result goes, that may change. And she got a huge laugh from these upscale Toronto liberals. And Megan points out uh, that there's a certain irony about her joke today because there has been a big rush of refugees across the U.S.-Canadian border to the point where they're now having to use the Olympic Stadium in Montreal, built in uh, 1976. took Montreal taxpayers 30 years to pay off that, uh, that white elephant, but it was a big deal in 1976, uh, as you recall, when Caitlyn Jenner became the first uh, transgender decathlon gold athlete or whatever the hell it was. Uh, and that, uh, that uh, stadium is now being used to uh, house all these refugees who've crossed the border into Canada from the United States. Most of them, apparently, are Haitian. And again, why Haiti, when we talk about refugees, we assume it's something to do with the Syrian civil war or the fact that Hillary Clinton wrecked Libya. Uh, on what basis are Haitians in the United States illegally fleeing to Canada illegally? And this gets to the heart of the conflict between a statue of liberty and the plinth and its poem about immigration. Because liberty and immigration, as I said in that monk debate, are not the same thing at all. And sometimes mass immigration is inimical to liberty. Those huddled masses yearning to breathe free, that's a huge assumption on the part of Emma Lazarus. What if they're not yearning to breathe free? And what if they don't understand freedom in the way that sophisticated Westerners do uh, in the second decade of the 21st century? What, for example, if they feel about freedom the way the guy who blew up the Manchester pop concert with Ariana Grande felt about it? Or the way the San Bernardino terrorists did when they gunned down that Christmas party? Or the guy in Orlando did, the son of the Taliban supporter. Uh, there was a successful immigration story. He's been in the United States 30 years. He supports the Taliban, and that's no obstacle to him standing behind Hillary Clinton at a rally. The Taliban supporter's son gunned down 50 people at a gay nightclub in Orlando. Biggest pile of gay corpses in the history of America, but didn't barely made a ripple among the LGBT Quirky activists because it wasn't a stump-toothed white redneck who'd done it. it instead, it was uh, one of those huddled masses yearning to breathe free who'd done it. The assumptions, the assumption that immigration and liberty are the same thing uh, are not the case at all. And in fact, what we see in the Western world today is that mass immigration, the huddled masses, uh, uh, pose great strains to liberty. Now, because of the sentimentalization about this, and, and that afflicts a lot of public policy. Generally, public policy is pretty cobwebbed. If you've noticed, one of the reasons why America is going off the fiscal cliff 
uh, is because we're wedded to um, 1930s social programs uh, that uh, the presumed with social security, for example, that life expectancy hasn't changed uh, across the last 80 years. Uh, and so there's a natural inclination for public policy uh, once it's in place to become pretty cobwebbed. But nothing like what has happened with the immigration debate. We're not the 19th century. Uh, we don't have huge numbers of mills and factories that we need relatively low-skilled workers for. For example, workers who can't speak very good English. Those jobs have gone. Those factories have closed. Uh, and we have a lot of low-level service jobs, but if you've been to Walmart recently uh, and uh, even to Burger King and McDonald's, you'd notice they're automating now. They have no need for low-skilled workers. So, the, so our immigration needs and the immigration needs of the developed world in general are not what they were in the 19th century. But something else has changed too. Uh, if you and I say this, by the way, as a I'm not just an immigrant to uh, the United States, but my great uh, great grandparents were immigrants to Ireland. Uh, they were uh, they were emigrating from the Tsar's lands to New York, and they'd scraped together their money and they'd saved for passage on a ship to New York, and the ship put in <laughs> on the Irish coast. Uh, at uh, Limerick, and uh, they thought Limerick was Manhattan. The, the uh, skyscrapers of Limerick, I guess, was what... Uh, uh, so they got off the boat, and by the time they found out that they were in Ireland, uh, not New York, the ship had sailed on across the Atlantic, and they were stuck <laughs> in Ireland. Um, that kind of image... They, they were very much typical of immigrants' families back then who moved west. Once you'd arrived, you couldn't keep in touch. You couldn't live. You could keep a few recipes. You could keep a few old folk songs. Uh, you could keep the language for family talk f with your older generation for rel relatives uh, for a generation or two. But you couldn't actually live in your old space in the new world. Now that's changed. If you, if you go to the Banlieue in Paris, for example, and you look at the satellite dishes on the roof, those are people who are basically watching hardcore uh, Islamist television every night. Uh, they, live, uh, they can live in the world they left behind, as the Taliban supporting dad of the Orlando nightclub killer did. Uh, that has changed too. And this idea that somehow... Somehow, nine, late 19th century views on immigration, because they're chiseled into the pedestal of a statue, chiseled on, well, actually they're not, they're just on the bronze tablet, but they're, 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 they're put on that bronze tablet on the base of a statue uh, in the late 19th century, 1883, that they have to stay unchanged for all time is ridiculous. Stephen Miller and those two senators have proposed certain practical modest changes uh, to US immigration policy. That's government policy. That's lawmaking. I regret the loss of poetry in our society. Uh, and I wish more of us knew more poetry. I wish more people recognized lines from The Rape of the Lock uh, or The Ancient Mariner or Hiawatha. But it is disturbing and depressing that the one poem everybody seems wedded to in the year 2017 is a bit of third-rate doggerel uh, that has unfortunately perverted the symbolism of one of the great statues of all time. Liberty enlightening the world. We should be in the business of broadcasting the big idea of liberty, saying, here it is. You'd like a piece of it. Why not try introducing it in your country? It's about exporting the big idea, not about importing the world to subvert that idea here at home. We'll see you next time.